keynote speaker is author Natalie Basil. Uh, Natalie is the award-winning author of We Are Each Other's Harvest and Queen Sugar, the latter of which has been adapted for television and was produced by Oprah Winfrey and Ava DuVernay. Natalie's nonfiction work has appeared in The Bitter Southerner, Lenny Letter, The Best Women's Travel Writing, and other anthologies. She's a Southern California native and is also a member of the San Francisco Writers Grotto. Natalie, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Jared, for having me. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, okay, hello, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be asked to uh, speak to you all this morning. Um, before I begin, I just want to say a few thank yous to David Allen and Justine Post and Jared White, Michelle Osborne and Lydia Gilmore and the rest of the, their colleagues at RAFI. Um, I really appreciate this invitation and I was uh, especially excited to hear the theme of this, uh, this year's conference and know that uh, you all are, have brought together so many different communities and stakeholders to celebrate uh, the work of farmers of color. So um, as a writer, I always get excited when I understand how the issues that I'm thinking about and kind of grappling with and the questions that I'm trying to answer fit into a broader context. I appreciate this because I feel like once I can locate my work and see it as part of a larger cultural conversation, um, that, bring, that makes the work feel more significant and it kind of makes it feel like it has more meaning. And that's when as a storyteller and a writer, I get very excited. Now, I don't, already, I don't have to tell you all that the work that you're doing is important. I know that you know that. Instead, what I hope to offer today is some historical context so that you feel as you continue to work with farmers and farmers of color, uh, that you're not working in a vacuum, that the work that you're doing is part of a larger story that this country is telling itself about who we are. What I wanna to talk to you today about is the story of land and the place that land ownership and land stewardship occupies in the American imagination. I wanna share my thoughts about how land ownership and land stewardship, or even the lack of land ownership and land stewardship informs the story of farmers of color. Because we can't understand our food futures without understanding the past. Now, I have a disclaimer to offer. I am not a historian. I'm a writer and a storyteller. But I've tried to assemble uh, the story of land in this country because my interest in land and the constellation of questions around land ownership and land stewardship inspired me to write the, the books that I've written so far, both Queen Sugar and now my nonfiction book, We Are Each Other's Harvest. As a storyteller and a writer, I'm interested in questions like, what does land represent in the American imagination? Who is included and who is left out of the stories that we tell ourselves? What historical connections uh, with land have black and brown people had in this country? And how does that explain where we are today? because the story of land is the story of this country. And what I think we all know is that in America, we are actually still struggling with this question of who gets to benefit and who is excluded. So let's start at the beginning <clears throat> and uh, I'll share this story of land. You can trace the story of land all the way back to the founding of this country. And what you see is that the founding fathers had very particular ideas about who should have access to land and who should be denied. So on this first slide, <clears throat> this demonstrates or this illustrates rather, 
something called the Headright System. In November of 1618, the Headright System was created in Jamestown, Virginia to attract new settlers to the colonies and address the labor shortage that was arising in the tobacco fields, which was the main crop that uh, the, the colonists were growing at the time. It was used mainly in Virginia, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Maryland. And the headright system gave 100 acres of land to each planter who had been in the colonies since May of 1616. So if you'd been here uh, in the colonies for about two years, you were, and you were a planter, you were granted 100 acres of land. The headright system gave 50 acres of land to anyone who was willing to cross the Atlantic from England or other parts of Europe <clears throat> or pay someone to cross the Atlantic and populate the colonies. So we can think of the headright system as kind of a land certificate or or stocks actually that were traded very much like we trade stocks today. But my point is, this was free land that was given to wealthy Europeans. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, many of the people who came to the colonies were white indentured servants. I just want to, okay. Many of the people who came to the colonies were white indentured servants. These were men and women who signed a contract in which they agreed to work for a certain number of years, usually four years to seven years, in exchange for transportation to Virginia. And once they arrived, the contract guaranteed them food, clothing, and shelter. Next slide, please. A lot of these indentured servants were poor Englishmen and English women uh, who ranged from skilled tr uh, tradesmen, carpenters and bricklayers and weavers and blacksmiths to convicted criminals. And for the next 87 years, these indentured servants flooded into the colonies. For example, between 1630 and 1680 alone, 75,000 people arrived in the colonies, 50,000 of whom were indentured servants. During that period, the governing body, the General Assembly, passed laws dictating how indentured servants could be treated. So, you know, you had to give them a certain amount of food, you had, you couldn't you know, beat them. There were all of these laws that were developed over these 87 years that dictated how indentured servants should be treated. Well, by 1705, the, generally, uh, the General Assembly passed what's called the Virginia Statutes. Let's go to the next slide, please. The Virginia Statutes required th that upon manumission, white indentured masters were supposed to give their white indentured servants something called freedom dues. These were um, a certain kind of, this was like your launching package that you got after you'd served your time. Now remember, at the same time, there were in the colonies <clears throat> enslaved Africans, but also uh, some free Africans. But for these freedom dues that were required for the indentured servants, white indentured servants, when they had served their time, they were given 50 acres of land, these were the men, 50 acres of land, 30 shillings in money or goods, 10 bushels of Indian corn and one well-fixed musket. White women who had been indentured were given 15 bushels of corn and 40 shillings. This again was land, cash, and food that was given to white indentured servants, where if there were black indentured servants at that same time, 
they were not given these things. Okay, so we advance forward, the colonies are, are spreading. Uh, we have the Declaration of Independence that was signed in 1776. And then in 1785, let's go to the next slide. Something that the government passed something called the Land Ordinance Act. The Land Ordinance Act of 1785 provided a clear system for taking Native American land and putting it in the hands of white settlers. It gave white settlers who were expanding the territories 640 acres at a dollar an acre. So again, we're talking about the history of land in this country, who was given access to that land and who was prevented from gaining access. Okay, next we have in 1790, something called the Naturalization, Naturalization Act. And let's go to that slide, please. The, natural, the Naturalization Act was a law that limited naturalization to immigrants who were defined as free white persons of good moral character who had resided in the United States for at least two years. The Naturalization Act allowed citizens to own land and to vote. If a person had been indentured, a white person had been indentured and they had served their time they also could be naturalized and could own property. So again, I'm trying to illustrate here how from the very beginning of this country's founding, there, were, there was a certain group of people who were supported and kind of, um, how would I say it? They were given opportunities in this country that that African-Americans, Africans were not. Africans and native people were not. Okay, so let's skip ahead um, about 90 years, less than 100 years, and we get to 1862. Next slide, please. And there was something called the Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act allowed white people to, to claim 160 acres of Western, in other words, Native American land for $1.25 an acre and cultivate it for five years. And if you did that, then um, you were allowed to stay on that land. This initially excluded the majority of Black people because you had to be a citizen in order to participate. And at that time in 1862, most black people were still enslaved. Within 10 years of the Homestead Act being passed, 85 million acres of Native American land had been sold to white, uh, white homesteaders. Okay, now we get to the Civil War. After Lincoln was reelected, on November 15, 1864, General William Tecumseh Sherman, and let's go to his slide, please, embarked on his march to the sea. He led 62,000 troops on a 285 mile march to Atlanta, from Atlanta to Savannah, Georgia. Uh, we were in the, in the last waning days of the Civil War, and on December 21st, 1864, Sherman captured the city of Savannah. Although the official Union victory was still months away, it seemed all but certain. But the tens of thousands of Black refugees who had left the plantations and had followed Sherman on his march gave him and the US government a glimpse into one of the biggest challenges that they would face in the post-war South. And that was 
what are we going to do <clears throat> with all of these uh, Black formerly enslaved people? On January 12, 1865, General Sherman dispatched his Secretary of War, let's go to the next slide, please, William M. Stanton. And he told Stanton to meet with 20 Black ministers on the second floor parlor of the Charles Green Mansion in Savannah, Georgia, to help him and the government figure out what to do with the nearly 4 million newly emancipated Black people. In attendance were several freeborn free and formerly enslaved men, including 41-year-old William Houston, a former slave and pastor of the Third African Baptist Church, another young man, 26-year-old Jason Lynch, who was a freedman and missionary from Baltimore. And Stanton asked this group, he said, he said to the ministers, state in what manner you think you can take care of yourselves and how you can best assist the government in maintaining your freedom. Well, by that point, black people in this country understood the value of land, even though they had not been land owners. They understood the significance of land ownership and the value of land. They understood that land was meant you could be a citizen. Land meant power, you could vote. Land meant agency, you could determine your own future. And land was an opportunity to accumulate wealth. Let's go to the next slide. So at that meeting, 67-year-old Baptist minister, a 67-year-old Baptist minister by the name of Garrison Frazier was chosen by his fellow ministers to speak to the group. Frazier had been, in, had been formerly enslaved in Granville uh, County, North Carolina, until he purchased his and his wife's freedom in 1857. Frazier said to William Stanton, the, free, the freedom as I understand it, promised by the Emancipation Proclamation is taking us from under the yoke of bondage and placing us where we can reap the fruits of our own labor. Next slide, please. He said, the way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and to turn it and till it by our own labor. We want to be placed on the land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. So in this moment, William, uh, I'm sorry, Garrison Frazier, as the spokesman for these 20 ministers, but also the nearly 4 million Black people was saying to the government, the US government, we understand what land means in this country. If you want to fulfill your promise, give us land and we will take it from there. But the land represented, land at that point was, was a tangible but also metaphorical um, illustration of freedom and self-determination. Four days later, on January 16th, 1865, Union General Sherman issued Special Field Order 15. Let's go to the next slide. During the war, the plantations in the rice country uh, had been abandoned by white planters and confiscated by uh, the US government as federal property. Let's go to the next slide. Special Field Order 15 gave most of the roughly 400,000 acres of land along a strip of coastal uh, Georgia, including the Georgia Sea Islands, extending 30 miles inland from the Atlantic and stretching from Charleston, South Carolina, 245 miles south to Jacksonville, Florida, 
special field order 15 gave that land to the newly emancipated, uh, newly emancipated slaves. The order read, the islands from Georgia, I'm sorry, the islands from Charleston south, the abandoned rice fields along the river for 30 miles back from the sea and the country bordering the St. Johns River, Florida are reserved and set apart for the settlement of the Negroes, now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the, United, uh, of the President of the United States. Let's go to the next slide. Sherman ordered that each family would be allotted 40 acres of tillable ground in the possession of which land the military authorities will afford them protection until such time as they can protect themselves or until Congress shall regulate their title. Sherman also suggested that his troops lend the newly emancipated people the mules that they had confiscated on their march to the sea to help the freedmen work the land. Thus was born the now famous phrase, 40 acres and a mule. Many African-Americans saw 40 acres and a mule as proof that the Emancipation Proclamation would finally give black people a stake on the land that they had labored on for centuries. They saw 40 acres and a mule, this special field order 15, as an opportunity for empowerment through the access to land and the freedom to determine their own destiny. This was America's opportunity to live up to its highest ideals. The order had had the potential to reshape and redefine what, what it meant for black people to participate in the American experiment. As historian Eric Foner writes, here in coastal uh, South Carolina and Georgia, the prospect beckoned of a transformation of Southern society more radical even than the end of slavery. So 40 acres and a mule was this opportunity for the systems that we, that we knew at the time to completely be reshaped for the United States to pull in its formerly enslaved people and give them access to land so that they could participate in this American experiment. By June, 1865, over 40,000 freedmen had been resettled on what was referred to as Sherman's land. But after Lincoln was assassinated, his predecessor, Andrew Johnson, reversed special, order, special field order 15 in an attempt to appease Southern, the Southern plantation class, Johnson reconfiscated much of the land that had been given to black people and returned it to the planters. At this moment, the country failed to uphold its promise to black people on whose backs the country had been built. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is all the official ways that the systems and structures in this country were designed to create access to land for white citizens and all the ways that, that now black people were denied similar access. Okay, and yet even though Sherman's special field order 15 was reversed over the next 70 years, Black people continued to persevere in their pursuit of land ownership. Let's go to the next slide. One of those people was my maternal great-great-grandfather, Mac Hall. After emancipation, Mac Hall, who was born in 1845, was a beekeeper, merchant, and farmer who eventually amassed <clears throat> about 600 acres of land in Georgiana, Alabama. So you see, for me, this, is a, this, story, this story that I'm trying to tell 
it's not just something that's abstract, it's personal. And there are hundreds of thousands of, of African Americans and, and Native people in this country who had an experience that was similar to the experience in my family. Mac Hall understood the value of land ownership and land stewardship. Farmers like him were <clears throat> often the leaders in their communities. They were the people who donated land for churches and for schools because they were farmers. The idea of land ownership and land stewardship was passed down through my family, through Mac Hall and his descendants on my mother's side. By the early 1800s, by the early 1900s, we can go to the next slide. Mac Hall's sons had migrated from Georgia, Georgiana, Alabama, near Tuskegee, actually. It's about, and Georgiana, Alabama is about an hour from Tuskegee. And Mac Hall's children attended Tuskegee, and his sons were bricklayers and, at Tuskegee who eventually migrated during the Great Migration to Detroit, Michigan. They were known as the Hall Brothers, and they migrated from Georgia, Georgiana, Alabama to this little township outside of Detroit called Royal Oak Township, where they used their farming and masonry skills to build a number of houses that stand to this day. One of their sons, my grandfather, along with his wife, Willa May, eventually purchased 11 vacant lots around the, this township, Royal Oak. And after my grandfather was killed, his name was Maimon Dean. After my grandfather was killed by a drunk driver, my grandmother, Willa May, sold off some of these lots whenever she needed money to feed her family but over, over a course of years, but she always held on to the other lots and she used them as a garden to grow food. In my mother's family, land was a source of sustenance. As I said, my grandmother, Willa May, was a gardener and she was not a farmer because she didn't have the space, but she was a gardener. And she grew land on the, she grew food on the land that she owned. Land was an asset that could be used as collateral. Land was something that could be passed down through the generations. And as I said, some of these houses that my uh, forefathers built stand to this day. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. By 1920, there were approximately 925,000 Black farmers in the United States. This is a photo of a group of farmers at a conference at the Hampton Institute in 1912. And when I came across this photo, I just, I, I almost got teary just to see how many Black people were gathered for this endeavor of farming the land. Unfortunately, uh, I'm sorry, at that time, Black people by 1920 owned 14% of all the arable farmland in this country. And we, and this, let's go to the next slide, please. So you can see on this map how much of the United States, especially in the South, Black people had acquired land across the South. It was something like 14 million acres of farmland that was owned and stewarded by black farmers. Unfortunately, by 2017, less than a hundred years later, there were only 45,000, less than 45,000 black farmers and landowners remaining. They owned and farmed less than one half of a percent of the total arable farmland. For example, between 1910 and 1997, African Americans lo have lost 90% of our of the farmland that we owned. In Mississippi alone, the current value of land lost between 1910 and 1997 in today's dollars is ne nearly 6.6 6 
$6.6 billion. $6.6 billion the African-American community has lost in terms of our community's wealth. As a storyteller, I was struck by these facts. I was struck by this idea that black farmers and landowners had really been decimated and our, and our numbers had declined so dramatically in less than a hundred years. We can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so in, as I said at the beginning of this talk, in my work as a, as a writer and a storyteller, I'm always struck when, or I'm always encouraged when I can see how the questions that I'm grappling with are part of a larger conversation that's happening. And in my novel, Queen Sugar, and then in my new book, We Are Each Other's Harvest, I wanted to try to explore this question of Black people's connection to the land, this story that I've been telling you. I wanted to try to figure out all the reasons that, that existed that explained this connection that we had and also the reasons why this decline has happened. That's part of what drove me to write this book. It turns out that there are two main causes for the dramatic decline in Black land ownership. The first is something called heirs property. And we can go to the next slide. Heirs property is the term that applies to land that has been passed from one generation to the next without a will or, a le or other legal documentation providing ownership. When the first generation of landowners died, remember people like my, my great, great grandfather, Mac Hall. Well, when that first generation of landowners started to die in the early, early 20th century, that land was divided among their heirs through informal ownership transfers. Parcels traded hands, often with, with the original landowner's name still on the deeds, which made land which made the ownership difficult to prove generations later. Heirs property is an issue that has plagued not just the African-American community, it has plagued the Latinx community in the Southwest. It has plagued indigenous communities in the West where it's known as fractional land, but it has disproportionately affected African-Americans throughout the South, accounting for an estimated one third of all black owned land being lost. What has happened? Predatory developers have exploited this informal system of transfer by buying one heir's portion of the land. Then using what's called the Torrens Act, they were able to force the sale of the land by requiring current heirs to prove ownership. So for example, Let's say I, my great, great, great grandfather has left my family, all of my cousins and my aunts and uncles acreage in Louisiana, where I'm from, or where my family is from, or Georgiana, Alabama, where Mac Hall was from. And over the generations, we have held on to that land with this informal understanding that we all kind of own a, a little, you know, a portion here, an acre, maybe I have an acre, my cousins have an acre, but I no longer live on that land. I have moved to California. Well, these predatory developers, knowing that this land is now valuable, and remember, a lot of that land that these formerly enslaved people owned was along that 400,000 mile stretch along the, south, uh, the, the Southeast coast. Well, that land was officially, was originally not that valuable, but now that is oceanfront property. Well, these predatory developers in an attempt to get that land use the Torrent Act. And let's say they contacted me. I'm out here in San Francisco living my life I'm not connected to the land, but I still own a portion. They contact me and they say, Natalie, we want to buy your, your, your acre or two of land that you own. Well, this is what they have done to Black families. Well, when I say to them, fine, I'm not interested in it, or I can't afford it, they 
buy my portion, and then they have the, the, the value of that land reassessed. And now it's worth millions of dollars. Well, my family members can't pay the taxes on that reassessment. And that forces the sale of all of that land, much of which was farmland. The laws allowed speculators to buy off the interest of a single heir, no matter how small, then forced the sale of the entire plot through the court system. In coastal areas like the ones I mentioned in Georgia and South Carolina that, are, that were part of the original 400,000 acres set aside by General Sherman, heirs property owners have seen thousands of acres of land auction off, auctioned off in tax sales because the heirs can't afford the inflated property taxes. In my book, I tell the story of the Reels brothers, and they're pictured in this slide, who in 2011 were victims of this act and spent the next eight years in jail for refusing to move off of their family land, even though they had never been charged or never convicted of a crime. They spent eight years in jail for contempt of court. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. The second fa factor that uh, contributes to the, this massive black land loss is our own US government and the discriminatory practices deployed against black and brown farmers by the U US Department of Agriculture. The USDA is the government body established by Abraham Lincoln in May, 1862 with the purpose of conducting research and development related to agriculture. This was supposed to be the agency that supported farmers with information and financial support in the form of loans. But it is precisely this organization that systematically deplo deployed strategies and discriminatory practices that undercut Black, Native American, and Latinx farmers by denying them access to loans and, and information for programs. In my book, I wanted these farmers and landowners to speak for themselves and tell their stories. Yes, I wanted them to talk about the hardships, but I also wanted them to describe the joys and the triumphs of being a farmer and being on the land. I wanted to tell stories that were dynamic and multidimensional. We Are Each Other's Harvest is therefore not just the stories of, of difficulty and struggle. It is that because that is the history. But it is also a book that tries to celebrate and amplify the voices and stories of the farmers who remain. So We Are Each Other's Harvest is really a collection of articles like the Reels Brothers, it's essays that tell the story of Black land ownership, it's poems, it's photographs of farmers, it's conversations, and it's quotes. I spent the better part of uh, over a year traveling around the country, talking to Black farmers, Black and Brown farmers, gathering their stories, and so I wanted to share a few of those stories with you now, just briefly, because in the next session, we're gonna let these, some of these farmers speak for themselves. So the book includes first person narratives. We can go to the next slide. Um, by a number of black, uh, farm, black and brown farming families who still remain. This first slide is of the Nelsons in Sondheimer, Louisiana. The Nelsons are a farming family. Um, they are four brothers and their father who just are filled with life and are so dynamic and ambitious and hardworking. The Nelsons have a vision for what they are trying to do in Sondheimer, Louisiana. And they represent to me um, so what they really represent to me what farming can be if they are given the support. When I met with the, with the Nelsons, um, Mr. Nelson actually shared the story 
of his uh, experience with the USDA um, and also his, his great grandfather's experience. And he, the first thing Mr. Nelson told me when we were standing uh, in front of his house was how his great, great grandfather after emancipation had worked the land. He and his wife worked this plot of land uh, with the understanding that they would eventually be able to buy it. This was in Mississippi. On the last day when uh, his grandfather was making the final payment, the landowner told him, I've changed my mind. I've decided I'm not going to uh, let you have this land after all. This was after working these fields for 20 years, making monthly payments. And it was devastating. And uh, um, I, I'm blanking on the gentleman's name. At, at, I think it was Earl Sr. Um, or I'm sorry, Earl Nelson Sr. He actually left with his family and moved to from Mississippi to Louisiana, where Mr. Nelson was born and raised his sons as farmers who are still farming today. Uh, the sons rage in age when I met them from 28. Adrian, the youngest, was 28 years old. And Bo, the oldest, far, oldest son, was in his early 40s. <clears throat> but even today, they shared stories of how they have had to struggle with the USDA in their local, uh, their U local USDA office and some of the challenges challenges that they've had. And in the book, their story is called Equal Ground. And they, they tell the story of being black farmers today, both, as I said, the, the struggles, but also the triumphs. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, this is another farming family uh, I feature in the book, uh, the Bluefords in Neesmith, uh, South Carolina. And again, this is a father and uh, his three sons who are farmers today and lovely, lovely people who, again, have a vision for what farming can be if they just can receive the support that they need. <clears throat> um, Mr. Bluford uh, tells the story of being raised on this same land that they, uh, that his, forefathers farmed. Um, and I didn't ask them, but I would bet since they're in South Carolina, it's entirely possible that the land that they farm was passed down through the generations and was part of that uh, special field order 15. So the Bluefords are another example of farmers who have worked the land and stayed on the land for generations Let's go to the next, uh, the next photo. Um, this is of Marvin Frank, who we will meet in the next session. Marvin is a farmer uh, in North, and I'm grinning so much because I just adore Marvin. Um, he is a cattle farmer in Red Springs, North Carolina. And Marvin has a wonderful story that uh, we will get into in the next session. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is Martha Calderon, um, an amazing uh, farmer. She and her family farm in uh, Vail, North Carolina, and we will meet Martha in the next session. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is Kamal Bell, who um, actually is entirely responsible for me being here today. Uh, Kamal is a dynamic young farmer um, in Cedar Grove, North Carolina, and we will meet him. And all of these farmer stories are included in the book. Okay, I wanted to, um, as part of We Are Each Other's Harvest, this, this nonfiction book that I wrote, I'm, as I said, I'm trying to tell the story of the history of land in this country. And I'm, and I'm trying to say to people, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is not something that just happened in the past. This story of land and land ownership and land stewardship, as you know, this is not just something that happened a hundred years ago and that is static. This is something that this story of land 
with black and brown people is a story that continues to this day. Part of that story is the story of the young people who are leading the charge forward. And I wanted to include their stories in the book because they are part of what's called the returning generation. These are young BIPOC farmers who are looking forward to what farming can be in the future. And we can go to the, the next slide. And one of the stories I tell um, is the story of the young people who founded Soul Fire Farm in uh, Petersburg, North Carolina. I'm not North Carolina, Petersburg, uh, New York. So again, as a storyteller, as a writer, as I try to tell the story of land in this country, I'm looking at the past, but I'm also looking at the present. And I'm also looking at the future, trying to wrap my arms around this wonderful, complex and dynamic story of black and brown people on the land in this country. And my final slide is of Naima and, we can go to the next slide, um, Naima and Leah Pennyman, who are really at the forefront of this uh, movement to, of young people to return to the land. And uh, they're on the cover of We Are Each Other's Harvest. And again, they are um, representative of the new generation of BIPOC farmers who have a vision for what farming can be in this country. Um, they are redefining what it means to be a farmer. They are redefining what it means to think about farming and community. They are thinking about all of the issues that we have to grapple with now, uh, poverty, wealth, intergenerational wealth, land stewardship, climate change. These, they represent what I think is the very best that this country has to offer. And, and that's my, uh, that's the final slide uh, that's part of my presentation. <clears throat> and so really, I think we have just about 10 or 15 minutes left if, if there are questions for me. Um, but I hope that this, as you continue to do your work, what I tried to do today is to, um, like I said, offer historical context so that you understand that the work you're doing is vital and it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is part of this larger story of this country and the role that land has played and the role that land and farming will continue to play as we move forward. So I just wanna say again, thank you so much to um, you all who are in this audience, to uh, Rafi and um, all of the people there who are doing this work to bring together all of these stakeholders. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here with you today and to um, share the, the story that I'm trying to tell both in uh, my novels and in my nonfiction work to really celebrate and amplify the essential work that farmers, BIPOC farmers are doing. Because really, I believe that um, they are the people who will lead us forward and not only help to save this planet, but who have the power and the vision to redefine what farming can be and offer new ideas and new opportunities and a fresh vision for how we can be on this land. <clears throat>